topic that I know you will find interesting, right? Uh, topic you know about is is contralateral training. Um, what is it exactly, and what are the what are the benefits of it? Right. So what I was saying when I had the leg injuries is I couldn't train lower body, but I had one leg that was good, right? So I would do what I could, leg press, you know, leg extension with one leg. And so what, physiologically speaking, when you think about this, you have one brain and you have one heart, right? But you have two limbs, okay? Two sides of the body. Well, the brain is sending signals to both sides of the muscle. So if I, let's say it was an arm that I injured, I injured my left arm, so I can't use the left arm, and I go into the gym, and I do curls with my right arm. Now my brain is firing signals that are going to both motor, both muscles, okay? Those nerves are still getting impulse on the, on the left side, even though it's not doing it. It's not the same as the right arm, right? And then the other thing that's happening is I said heart, right? So the heart's pumping blood to the entire body, including the non-training arm. And it's in, including the nutrients, the hormones that are being released from the right side, so it's gaining ben benefits. Now, it's not getting a direct stimulation, right? The mechanical stimulation, but it is getting the blood flow. It is getting the nerve uh, activity going there. And again, it's not causing a, a contraction, but it's there's some nerve activity that's going there. And all that adds up to maintaining strength and muscle mass better. Obviously, it's not going to prevent atrophy or muscle loss and strength loss. But what we find is when you do some form of contralateral training, you lose less strength and less muscle mass. And then if we want to, we want to talk about further, let's say the individual has a, an injury, right? A bodybuilder has an injury. Like I said, he injured his left arm so he can only train his right arm try to maintain as much muscle and strength in the left arm. The other thing he can do is take supplements. You don't stop taking your supplements. Take creatine. Creatine has been found in people who have been casted, say, like their arm is literally broken or put in a cast. They can't use that arm. They find that those who are taking creatine lose less muscle mass in that limb that was not active and less strength. And fish oil as well. So it's not so much that you are getting gains but you actually not losing not losing yeah, what you not. have already fast <laughs> yeah, enough, yeah right you can't expect your left arm to grow just by training your right arm but like i said it'll help to prevent some of the muscle loss and the, the strength loss that you're going to get that's very interesting so is this something that existed for a while now or is it is it a brand new concept oh it's no it's well it's 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 well known probably i'd say it's going back into maybe uh don't quote me on this, but probably the 80s, probably 80s or so where it really started gaining popularity and, and people were knowledgeable about it. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger of, let's say, speaking of arms, like one arm gets really, really, you know, <laughs> big and the other one gets much smaller with that? So mm -hmm. saying if, let's, if one was not being trained? Yeah, like if you yeah. train one and the other one's not getting right. the same pump, right, you, you're going to end up, and let's say you have a, you have a long-term injury for like, I don't know, Sure. months you know what i mean you end up with a really big arm one arm you know i'm just saying <laughs> could that happen of course um definitely um but the question is would you rather have one arm atrophied or both arms <laughs> atrophy <laughs> so i'd rather have at least one arm it's, i guess it's a personal question right i'd rather have one arm that was bigger versus uh this arm's too big i want it as small as the other arm um and, and, and of course, the other arm will, will catch up. Catch up, for sure. Eventually. Okay, next thing is a lot of readers want to know is uh, pre-exhaust training. What is that exactly, and what is the proper way of doing a pre-exhaust yeah. training? So you know, what's really interesting about pre-exhaust is um, there are two studies, acute studies. There's, there's, there's about four studies in the literature that I can um, call upon when we're talking about pre-exhaust. Two of them are acute meaning they just looked at what was happening during the workout and two of them are long term meaning they trained that way for like 8 or 12 weeks okay so let's first talk about the acute ones okay but before we talk about the acute let's talk about what is pre exhaust because most people don't know what it is if you ask most bodybuilders they'll tell you you pre exhaust by doing a single joint movement right so let's say it's chest by doing flies and then following it with a multi-joint movement like the bench press. Why? 
This is the, everybody knows how to do it. They just don't know why. Okay. And it's the, why, it's the why that gets everybody caught up and even the researchers. Okay. So the why is not because it's going to stimulate the pecs more. Okay. The name tells you what it's doing. It's to exhaust the pecs. So these researchers, and this is two independent labs published in the journal of strength and conditioning research. And I, I know the publisher personally and told them the, the flaws in the study, but these were published. So they published two studies saying that pre-exhaust doesn't work. Why did they conclude that? Because they looked at EMG data in the chest. So they measured how much muscle activity was being done in the chest, right? And then the supporting muscles during the bench press, the shoulders and the triceps. So when they did the pre-exhaust first, they did the chest, the fly, first, and then did the bench press, there was less muscle activity of the pecs than if they just did the bench press fresh, right? Because the prior exercise exhausted the pecs. And, but they concluded that pre-exhaust doesn't work because it doesn't increase muscle activity. But it, that's not what it's supposed to do. When you exhaust the muscle, it can't fire anymore, so it's going to have less electrical activity, right? So they actually proved that it works. It exhausted the muscle. An exhausted muscle fires with less electrical activity because it's exhausted. That is why you do pre-exhaust so that when you finish the set on bench press, you finish the set because the pecs were exhausted, not the triceps, not the shoulders. If you came in and did chest first and you have very strong triceps, right? Or let's say, actually, let's flip that around. You have very weak triceps through your limiting factor. Your triceps are going to fatigue before your pecs. So you're never going to stimulate your pecs adequately enough with the bench press. So one of the tricks you can use is to pre-exhaust the pecs so that now you end that set when the pecs are exhausted, right? And like I said before, with full body training, exhaustion is an important role in muscle growth because of the growth factor release that you get, the hormone release. Reaching muscle exhaustion is important for muscle growth. So they're showing that it actually works, but they were concluding incorrectly that it didn't work because they're not sure what pre-exhaust is as most bodybuilders are mm -hmm. is it kind of like a, is it kind of like doing a superset you know in a superset you do it from one thing to it the is other a superset. Thing. you don't really rest um you do the right you, it's a pre-exhaust superset but it, that doesn't you, you still don't need to do it back to back without any you can take a little bit of rest because the muscle's been fatigued and even though if you rest a few minutes, it's still going to be fatigued when you get to the bench press. So that's less important. But yes, it's typically done as a superset that way. So in your opinion, you would recommend do, using the pre-exhaust? Yeah. So in the other, so there were two, like I said, there were also two long-term studies. Okay. One of them found no real difference between pre-exhaust and typical training where you the bench press first, right? And then you finished your workout with eyes or single joint movements. Okay. They found no difference, but again, remember you can't compare workouts that way. You can't compare one workout to the other to see which one is best. Workout programs require change, right? So you need variety. If you do the same type of training, you're, you're never going to adapt and progress. You need to change it up. So you can't really just take random people who work out and put them on two different programs to really see which one is better, okay? Because if you ask me what the best program is for you, I'll tell you it's the one that you're not doing. Meaning, when you're done with the program you're currently doing, you need to switch it up. If you're doing 10 reps per set, three sets, when you're done with that workout, you now need something different, 20 reps per set. Uh, fewer, you know, you need, you need change. So in that context, pre-exhaust is variety right? So it's a different way to train. It's a different way to stimulate the muscle. You can't really look at it as a, which one is better? This one, it's, when is it better for you? If you've been doing straight sets for the last two years, pre-exhaust for six to eight weeks is probably going to help you because you've changed it up, 
right? You've changed it up. You've provided a different way to stimulate the muscle. And that's what it's really, really about. Interestingly, though, a second study in pre-exhaust where they had them do it for 12 weeks actually found a trend. And again, it wasn't st strong statistically. They found great strength in the pre-exhaust group, which is bizarre, but also greater muscle uh, muscle thickness in the, uh, the leg, which is what the muscle they were studying. So, um, so again, there's a study showing it may be beneficial. There's one showing there's no difference. And then the two acute studies, like I said, were just flawed because they don't really, don't really know what they're looking at. But anytime you're talking about a training technique, it's really not about which one is best. It's about variety. When does it work best in your program? You know what I mean? You need change.